evening and welcome to News Night. In the next 60 minutes. If you dress and come to school, your tail, you come and sit on floor, your tails will be dirty. We don't even fail to come to school. So we are begging the government to give us chairs. While 7,000 school children in the Pandai district featured in our Schools of Shame series continue to slam it hard on the floor because of a lack of furniture, the man they hope will turn their fortunes around has this to say. Recently, I saw some TV programming. They were talking about Ghana's school of shame. And I was ashamed because of all the great things happening in the country, we want to focus on the negative. Can you look straight in the eye of these children and tell me they are coming from schools of shame? They are coming from schools of fame. Meanwhile, Bono East Regional Minister visits accident site where eight pupils lost their lives while crossing the Volta Lake to school in the Sine East district. It's a case that we ask the government to ask the people that's a need to me to see them. We're live on the ground. Also tonight, the untold story of how thousands of Ghanaians have been left without their investments and facing even more peril due to government's failure to pay them their investments in the amalgamated mutual fund, now set to be further wiped out by the domestic debt exchange. We hear from affected investors, plus the latest on negotiations to exempt individual bondholders with five days to the expiration of the debt exchange deadline. Also this evening. And it has been gazetted, uh, it's a law. So for now, uh, nothing can be done on the part of PURC. Recent tariff increments cannot be reversed. PRC fires back at AGI and the Chamber of Commerce following their demands for a reduction in the 48% increment, which they warn could potentially collapse the industries. Had increments in the industry category by about 48%, even though across board it was 8%. When you go into it, uh, it's not the same for all. And in business, Talo Oil is contesting the over. 300 million dollars tax assessment by the Ghana Revenue Authority for this year. We have it more on business at 6 30. And in sports, the Ministry of Youth and Sports has debunked allegations of disagreement in the camp of the Black Galaxies ahead of the Chan quarterfinal clash with Niger. We have that and more in tonight's edition of News Night Plus. The Ministry of Finance is tonight dismissing any wrongdoing in the management of the COVID-19 revenues details that he explains the funds were expended in accordance with the Public Financial Management Act. You want to stay with us for that and more or here on Newsnight. Plus your views 055 And we start with our uh, series we've been running in the last uh, week or so titled schools of shame we know that 7,000 school children in the pandai district featured in the schools of shame series continue to slam it hard on the floor because of lack of furniture well ghana's education minister dr yawasi Duchum has questioned why the plight and struggles of the rural poor is being published well this follows the airing of two out of the four part schools of shame series put together by joy news well listen to excerpts of what jojo kobna and the team found when they visited pandai we are not sparing any efforts to make education in Ghana of the best quality and fit for the needs of the 21st century. Poverty should not be an excuse for any Ghanaian child not to reach their full potential. Bashir Nuidin speaks for about 7,000 children without desk in the Pandai district. What is disturbing our space? We don't have furnitures. Sometimes when we are coming to school, we feel bored. We don't even feel to come to school because we don't have furnitures. If we dress and come to school, your tail, you come and sit on floor, your tails will be dirty. So we are begging the government to give us chairs. Every morning, these children carry stools and plastic chairs on their heads and head to school. Many of these children have walked several kilometers just to access school. Their school, Balai DA Primary School in the Pandai district of the northern region, has no furniture. So their parents bought plastic chairs for them. Today is very important to these pupils. They have to write the end of their third term examinations. This examination is critical for them as it will determine whether they will be promoted to the next class or not. Those who are fortunate settle in their chairs 
and majority of them go down on their knees not as a form of worship but to write exams. Those with plastic chairs put their exam papers on their lap and write while others kneel and put their exams papers on their chairs. With time, tiredness sets in and many who are sitting on the bare floor start to kneel. As time progresses, some change their positions and then lie on their bellies and begin to write. When we come and sit on the floor, our things will be dirty. The next day, when you go, we will, we, will, we will like to wash your things, but your parents will not agree for you to wash the things. Because the soap, the soap is now, uh, all things are now critical. You don't have money to buy soap. Every day when you come to school, you go and you want to wash your things. Your parents will not agree. Bala is not the only school in the Pandai district without furniture. The district education officer of the Pandai district, Yao Safo, paints a gloomy picture of the furniture situation. And the district, as we speak, has a furniture deficit of about 7,000, over seven, a little over 7,000. So it means that when, after distributing the uh, furniture that has been provided, there's still a large deficit to be covered. You have uh, the plea of some of these pupils, plus the district education officer of Pandai, crying for help, saying the situation is critical. Well, the education minister, Dr. Yao Oseya Duchum, has been responding to the Joy News findings. Listen. Recently, I saw some TV programming. They were talking about Ghana's school of shame. And I was ashamed. Because of all the great things happening in the country, we want to focus on the negative and get the world to know that there are negative things in Ghana. Can you look straight in the eye of these children and tell me they are coming from schools of shame? They are coming from schools of fame. They're going to change the story of Ghana. This young man and woman has a fierce determination and is palpable when you get close to them. They want to change the face of this country. What we couldn't do, they are going to do it. All that we need to do is to let them know that yes, there are challenges in the country, but we should shine a spotlight on these great things that we are doing. And if we can take a cue, we should rather do a program that highlights these young men and women and tell the world that Ghana is moving in spite of the challenges. Yes, there are challenges. But I tell you this, the children of Ghana are so well prepared to be the best in the world. And this comes from somebody who has taught in and studied the various education systems around the world. I taught in America for 12 years. I became developer of schools in Los Angeles for another 12 years. Well, let's uh, interrogate a bit more uh, what uh, the education minister has been saying there. I want to bring in a member on the education committee uh, in, in parliament uh, who will join us right now. Also joining us as executive director of the Institute for Education Studies, uh, Peter Antipate, uh, joins us also on the line. Uh, Mr. Pate, thank you for your time here on Newsnight. Good evening, Ivan. Uh, and uh, Dr. Clement Park, I'm grateful that you could join us. Yes, Ivan, good evening. Uh, Mr. Antipate, let me start with you. Do you agree with the education minister when he says the schools that we found with children sitting on the floor, some of them have no roof over their heads and under trees. They are schools of fame. <laughs> well, for me, I think that the first reaction of anybody managing an educational system seeing this would be how do I help these kids move from this symbolic atmosphere where they are being forced to study under trees, sitting on the floor to write. How do I move these kids from this kind of environment to an environment where we can now help them see the, the, the future that they so much aspire to be? As, an, as, as somebody managing an education system, the first reaction will be, how do we help children from this background to also see the kind of future that children from different backgrounds, I mean rich background are, are currently experiencing. So it is not, uh, it's not a matter of saying that this, this should be classified as schools of fame. No. What, what is so famous about this? This is a situation that these kids find themselves in without no fault of theirs. 
and an institution is coming out with such a good documentary to help because education is a collective responsibility to help throw light on this so that where government has failed to help this other bodies, NGOs, CSOs, and international organizations would also see and come and help these children move from wherever they are to, to a, a better environment. So the reaction should be a positive one. We should be welcoming some of these initiatives so that we know. Because the fact is that the Ministry of Education knows that there are schools like this because they have data that speaks to them in, in, in terms of how the various schools in various districts well, locations well, as, as far as, as far as the Dutrim is concerned, the focus should not be on those schools you say he knows exist, but those schools he believes uh, are indeed in a, a place of wealth and represent the positive. He says focus on the positive and the good news and not about those schools where the children are still sitting on the floor without roof on the, over their heads. If we continue like that, who is, who is going to tell the story of these kids? He, he always says that he came from a very bad, bad, poor background and is unable to rise to this level. So he is the first person who should appreciate the state of this case. He should be welcoming some of these things and he should be taking steps to ensure that kids in this country do not study under these conditions. About four, five, six years ago, we all witnessed what happened in Jamra, Breme Jamra. And up to now, that particular building and other buildings in the same school environment still have not seen any kind of improvement. We have seen what is happening in uh, the northern region. We have seen what, is just, what just happened in the voter region, where eight students in their quest to experience education have to die. These are the realities of the people living in this country. And if we, if people, if, 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 if institutions, the media, if they don't throw light on these things, who will tell the stories of these people? Who is going to help them, help them so that they will be able to move from the poverty state that they are in, the deprivation that they are experiencing, to a very level that they can say that we are bridging the gap of inequality. Uh, we need the media to do this. So when the media comes up with some of these things, we should applaud them and we should take steps to rectify these anomalies, these I mean, insensitive anomalies that we are, in fact, this wickedness that we are perpetrating on the lives of innocent children of this country. I want to bring in Dr. Clement Park. Dr. Park, I mean, the minister has a point as or not when he says we have good schools we have schools of fame i think schools that are doing fantastic in terms of the grades that you're churning out the quality of the teaching uh, you know children have computers they have roofs over, over their heads he says that is an example of what we should be highlighting and those are the schools of fame that we should be highlighting and that often uh, there's too much negativity you agree with him well even sadly i don't because the minister is not being realistic. Uh, as an educationist uh, myself, and as the member of parliament representing a likely rural constituency, and knowing the statistics, I dare say that the so-called schools of fame that he wants us to highlight versus the schools of shame, which are more dominant and prevalent, I would argue that the schools that he wants us to showcase are largely urban elite schools. And most of these schools, if they were to be basic schools, are private. If you look at the statistics and you even look at the funding that has been going to the public basic school system, the funding has been diminishing over the last five to six years, even as we speak, the truth is the truth. Go to every single region, every single district, and I can tell you that over 80% of the schools would fit into the mold that your media houses documentary captured. These school buildings are dilapidated. There is no furniture. There is teacher deficit. Government has failed to pay capitation grants for two years. Heads of basic, public basic schools cannot even buy chalk. They can buy registers. 
textbooks which have been produced have not even been distributed to all the schools. So why would the minister expect us to push this under the carpet and to highlight what he claims to be schools of fame? He is not being realistic, and we must face the facts. We cannot pretend that all is nice and dandy when we know it is not. I am actually disappointed in the minister's posture. He should be commending the media for highlighting what is falling short, and he should be doing his best to ensure that the resources that have been voted to support the public school system, that the money that should go to pay for computation grants, to pay for the administrative cost of running these institutions, are made available. We all want good schools, but if they don't exist, is it a crime to highlight the fact that they don't? Let's talk solutions for a second. I know you are a member of parliament on the education committee. The reality is these schools exist. Um, what's, the, what's the solution? How do we address that problem? Well, first of all, we can begin with the nature of educational infrastructure. There are many, many communities that don't still have schools, although they have populations sufficient enough to merit and warrant their own educational infrastructure. Secondly, even in the communities where this educational infrastructure exists, the lack of maintenance and the inability of the state to regularly remit uh, capitation grants, which will be used to fix broken doors, broken windows, uh, sometimes uh, fix uh, leaking roofs, and even organize uh, basic activities for these students, has not been going. If you look at the allocation to basic schools over the years, particularly with the introduction of the Fresno High School, the funding towards basic schools has been diminishing. Then we also have the challenge of uh, uh, teacher deficits, where when you go to the rural parts of this country, if we were to say that uh, factors like the school buildings are okay, they have furniture, we still do not have sufficient teachers. We have schools where you have only two teachers running the entire school. We have junior high schools where it is only the headmaster and two teachers running the entire school. These are the realities. So the solution is for government to make the requisite resources available in a timely manner, sufficient enough to be able to address these issues. Okay. Uh, Dr. Clement Park, thank you very much. Uh, Peter Anti uh, Pate, you agree uh, very briefly that it's just about providing the resources, but isn't it more complex than that? Because if it's that simple... We should have fixed this by now. It's, it's more about looking at how we redistribute those resources and more importantly, making good use of the data available to the ministry. Even it is clear and we know that as it stands now, when you go to the ministry and you, you go to, you, you, you look at the MS data, you will know the number of schools that are under three. You will know the number of schools that do not have requisite text tables, number of teachers, the data is there. So we think that you ne we need to start looking at the data and then start allocating resources to those places that need these things more than the, the, the blankets and then the, uh, 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 just distributing resources without recourse to any kind of proper data. We also need to do infrastructure mapping. I'm told that this is something that is being done by the ministry so that we know which areas need these resources. We should be able to allocate these scarce resources that we have to people who need them most. Okay. Uh, thank you very much also for your thoughts. Uh, that's uh, the Executive Director of the Institute for Education Studies, Peter Anti Pate. We'll stay a while longer on issues um, relating to education, and this has to end. Those are the words of Bono East Regional Minister Kwesi Dujan as he visits the accident scene where eight people lost their lives while crossing the Volta Lake to school in the Sine East District. They were among 20 people on board a boat crossing the lake from the Atika com um, community to Wayakopa. Well, we'll hear uh, from the minister shortly, but first, listen to the Sine East District Chief Executive. Jerome Kofijima addressing the inadequate teacher student ratio, which, um, if addressed, uh, could prevent some of these unfortunate incidents from happening in the future. Some of the communities we don't have schools, but it is scattered and far. Uh, those that are not far, because of the river, we have, we have the Sene River joining the Akusumo River. So it's very large. So mm -hmm. some of the areas you have to cross in before you get to the next school or the closest school. Mm -hmm. That is why 
I had submitted list of uh, uh, teachers who have completed University of Cape Coast, Winneba, and the Jackson College of Education for them to be employed by Ministry of Education. I went to Minister Honorable Adichu several times requesting for those teachers to be employed. And here in the case, they have not been employed and we still have an adequate number of teachers. So assuming that we're having enough uh, teachers, those there would have gotten annexed. The fact that the government hasn't given approval for us to create additional schools, would have used Wayoko Preschool and they have annexed there. So okay. the teachers will be staying there and they'll be teaching the children. Well, so that's the Senate East District Chief Executive Jerome Kofijima there earlier recounting the incident to us and what he believes um, could be able to address the situation. But the Buno East Regional Minister himself, Kwesi Edu Jan, has been visiting the area. Thankfully, he joins us live. We're grateful for your time. So from your visit today, what would you say was the preliminary findings? Um, I, I, I think um, it is a sad day um, for, I mean, eight case between the ages of 9 to 15 having lost their lives in such a manner not in doing anything bad but i guess you know, for the quest for knowledge uh, the desire to have education and it all stems from the fact that you know the area they are living happened to be a protectorate area that is part of the forest area under uh, the Dija forest so habitation in that area has been restricted. As a result of that, the government has not been able to do projects there at all because it was, you know, it it was it it was declared that they cannot stay there. Period. But it's just of recent. I, I guess just last year, I'm told that they had a waiver that they could abode in that place. You know, just part of the land. So because of this reason, there hasn't been much development. And um, there are a lot of violence on that part of the descent. So citizens crisscross from one island to another, you know, for essential services like medical, health, and education. So it happened that this case were moving from one island to another for schooling when the uh, canoe capsided. And unfortunately, um, 12, only, only 12 were rescued. Eight out of the 12 kind of lost their lives. Well, we've been hearing uh, from uh, the district chief executive, for instance, and some other uh, members of the community, the main concern, I'm sure you've also been raising it, but the issue is the timelines as to when we can get this adequate, inadequate teacher-student ratio re issue resolved and such that these communities that are cut off from the rest of the, uh, the other areas would get schools in the area such that children will not have to cross the Volta Lake in, in their quest for education. In fact, I've already, it, it isn't much of a problem as of today. Um, earlier on, I've had a discussion with the Director General of Ghana Education Services, who has agreed to engage or recruit some of the indigenous who are qualified as teachers to teach in those areas. So on the part of personnel, I think um, GES has stepped in and has agreed to assist in the provision of qualified personnel for the schools. What, when exactly is, when exactly is that going to happen, Mr. Edujan? Oh, immediately. I've asked the the director for GES in the district to give me the list of schools and the the personnel that may be required to teach in those areas. So I'm expecting that by Friday this week. And immediately I get that I will have a discussion with the director general of GES to get that accomplished. What about, you said beyond education, the community folks cross this river body on a regular basis to access almost everything else. So it's also about using that transportation, that means of transport safely. As the chair of the Regional Security Council, um, what are you going to do about the providing safe transport if people need to make that crossing? Yes, you know, the, the, the issue is... Uh, in fact, as I had a dis as discussed earlier on with some of the media houses, I intend to engage um, VRA 
um, the CEO of VRA, Jeffado, and uh, Zoom Lion. They have some um, organization that deals with uh, the safety and other activities on the lake. So my intention is to engage these two organizations to see how we can get some light, some facilities in respect to, you know, um, their, their transportation needs. So I work with some of these agencies. I also have a discussion with um, other NGOs to see how we could assist with some of the boosts. But the, the, the fact of the matter is that, you know, these kids are so young that I, I personally do not see the reason for allowing them to 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 get themselves into that trouble. So the the the, the earners also lies on us as children to make sure that our kids are equipped with uh, things like life jackets, you know, and that when they are traveling. You know, if you are living by the, the riverside, at least some busy skills and other things that will enable you to 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 live. Because the government cannot really enforce some of these things in those rural areas. Mm. The responsibility lies on their experience as well to make sure that our kids are well equipped before they leave home. You you went so to the community a, a, a serious discussion with parents to make sure that. We, as parents, also, uh, uh, you know, have responsibilities, and we need to respect them responsibly. You went to the community today. Did you cross that river yourself? Yes, I did. Uh, are you in a boat? Yes, I did. I wonder, were you in a life jacket yourself? Yes, I was in a life jacket. I mean, if you could access a life jacket, why is it that the, the, the kids could not find a life jacket? It even a question like that the kids could not have life jackets. There are life jackets in the assembly. I think it's just a question. It's just a, a matter that... So so the assembly... Parents, parents should, you know, parents should also assume some responsibility. No, I, 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 I think but, you, made, you made the point about the parents. So the it's assembly... It's a question of yes, life yeah. jackets not available. No, I mean, I'm, I'm just, I just want to clarify. So the assembly have life jackets. Yes, the assembly had a life jacket. Okay, so you got your life jacket from the assembly? No, I, I got mine from Zim Lion before I left Ichima. Okay, so 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 the question is, you, you got one. So Zoom Lion has a life jacket. When you were going, do you at least take some of that for those who need it to cross tomorrow? I, I, I don't think that life jacket is a problem over there. It isn't a question of life jacket. The question is as to whether... The people are willing to use the life jacket. No, but is it available? Is it, of it, it, minister, of life jackets? minister, is it if a, a child tomorrow wants to cross to school, is it available at the point of crossing that when you're boarding that boat that you used, the child can grab it and put it on it, and an adult can help him where to cross? It is the responsibility of a, a parent to make sure that before the kids get into the boat. They have life jackets. They yes. not a question. But, but, the, but the, life jacket, the life jacket, life jacket. that's what it's I'm asking. It's not a question at all. No, that's what I'm asking for clarity. At the point of boarding a boat to cross, is the life jacket available at that point? And is this visible and, and being uh, in, in somebody's possession to hand over to people crossing? The, the question is, you know, I've already answered that unavail there is not a problem of unavailable. No, but when you say when it says on, it's not available, no, where they, they are available. No, it's important, Minister. They are available no. where? Well, the, the question is: Are parents ready to make sure that their lives, their kids, are safe before they go out? That's the question. No, but so what, yeah. I, so the question is: You're saying parents should ensure that the children wear the life jackets? Is that your argument? It, it, it is the responsibility of the government to provide a neighbor environment, including the life sure jackets. Facilities are provided. Yes, and it is also the responsibility of a parent to make sure that the facilities that the kids need for them to go out. They, they, they make sure that they enforce it. Okay, so but, but we need the, to clarify the this. Has this responsibility. Minister, the reason, the, the, the reason why, also Minister, the reason why, this, the reason why this question is important is that as we speak tonight, 
tomorrow people will still need to cross. Children may still have to cross because they don't have any other alternative. So you need to you need to be clear with parents. If tomorrow a parent need to get a child across to school, where can the parent get the life jacket to use? Assembly has been directed. The assembly has been directed to make it available. And as I mentioned to you, it's it's like having a kid in a car. A car has a seat belt. It's the responsibility of a parent to enforce that the seat belt okay yes, it's but, known but by the you, kid. But if you don't the have government a but, cannot force the parent no, but you just to said, make sure you to just, ensure that Vanessa, you just said that you, responsibility you've now, of the kid. You've just said you've now directed of the parent, rather. You, you've just directed the assembly to make it available. That's an admission that before yes. now the life jackets were not available to the children and the parents to use to access. Come again. You just admitted that before now, the life jackets were not available to the parents and their children to use. Life jackets are not available for parents to use. Is that that's the question you are asking? Yes, because you've just directed my, that. My, my answer is that it is the responsibility of the parent to make sure that they have life jacket. Okay. To make sure that they have life jacket before the kids get yeah. into the so, boat. So the, the you, were, you said the poor parents in this very poor, extremely well, deprived know, community should buy life jackets. They are, they, nobody is saying it's a very poor area. What I said is that it used to be a protectorate area. Habitation was not allowed previously. It's just of recent that it has been allowed. They are fishermen, they are farmers, they are cattle dealers, they are animal really. Mm. Thank you very much. Uh, that's the Bono East Minister, the regional minister. Uh, mm -hmm. There, uh, very quickly, very very briefly, um, Kofi Asari with the Africa Education World issued a statement on this. Uh, Kofi, you had asked for this, the same thing. We've just been pushing the minister on about making the transportation safe. Um, how quickly do you want to see this done? Very briefly. Immediately. Uh, immediately. This should be done. I disagree with the regional minister that government cannot enforce standards at the at the at the both sides. I vehemently disagree with the regional minister that the issue is not about the availability of land jackets. We have been in touch with education officials in the district since morning, and I can confirm that there were no life jackets. And they even indicated that even for their field trips, visiting island communities from the district capital, when they are going, they struggle to get life jackets. And so they themselves, the education officials, need life jackets in, in addition to the students who live in uh, island communities. The third issue is that, of course, we all know that the, the boats were overloaded. And so if there were, uh, if there was, if there was effective regulatory oversight, I'm sure the same person who would have prevented the boat from moving without life jackets would have prevented the same from moving because the boats were overloaded. So I believe that the Ministry of Education and VA should work together and get every child who is in basic school living in an island school community a life jacket. Teachers should be oriented such that in the same way teachers inspect school uniforms when the people come to school in these island schools, they should inspect life jackets provided for by the GES or the Ministry of Education every morning. That is not something without the financial might of the genius or the ministry of well education. we just heard from the minister who is, is chairs the regional security council that he's directed the assembly to provide life jackets he before he bothered that boat picked one up he, he said he told us where um zoom lion so clearly he knows where they are it's a question of making it available for them and tomorrow we'll be checking if that directive has been carried out because as we speak right now those people in that community do not have any other choice than still bought that uh, very risky boat across including children uh, many of them perished as a result of their desire to get education. Well, let's do some of your messages before we go for business with George Riafi. Samin Kumasi uh, says, did I hear the education minister say Joy FM should rather highlight the gains made by the government than focus on those dilapidated schools in America where he was teaching? Had he ever seen children learning in such environment? Uh, JB from OC says, the education minister of Ghana, is, this is totally unacceptable. Look at um, the poor response, he says. And then this one from Steel in Saltpond says, furniture supply to our schools are stolen by people living near the 
these schools, the pupils and students damage the furniture. It is not the case that furniture were never supplied. Thank you, Steele, for your message. And this one from Kotuka Courage in Anglogala Shibi says, can you please ask the minister for me, since the change in the new school curriculum, which of the textbooks have been produced to basic seven and basic eight, the teachers have no textbooks to teach. Well, that's coming up in the third part of our School of Shame um, series put together by Joy News and Jojo Kobina. You want to look out for mm. that. And Henry Nkaswa says the education minister last week was lamenting the tertiary institutions teaching programs that, in his view, were not relevant and not meeting the demands of to today's job market. Was he highlighting the positive aspects of our education system? That's Henry's question. And Ni, uh, James in Accra says, I think you are misrepresenting the minister. If I heard him right, he's rather asking that we appreciate these children who, against all odds, are trying to cope. Okay. Well, Ni Tojo from Tema Newtown says the education minister should appreciate some of these bad or negative reports for a better running system. Ken uh, from who also we see your message. Thank you very much for your mm. messages. And then there's also mm -hmm. one here says, please, what happened to stakeholder collaboration? What makes the minister think uh, we want to wash our dirty linen in public? All the little boy asked for was chairs. Such a basic learning tool. And he says uh, this uh, minister uh, doesn't deserve his portfolio. Well, let's do uh, business. You can send me more of your messages. It's via WhatsApp. is 55 Many of you are also tweeting at us um, on Twitter and also on Facebook. You can post your messages there as well. We're live on myjoyonline.com. Also on Love 99.5 FM in Kumasi. George is here with business. Hello, George. Interesting development, MFA. Mm -hmm. Well, coming up in business, Talu Oil contests over 300 million tax assessment by the Ghana Revenue Authority for this year, as well as a separate one done in 2022. And industry's uh, hints of more layoffs in Bank of Ghana goes ahead to increase policy rate from next week. The Business News on Newsnight is brought to you by MTN Business. Welcome to the new world of business. Allianz Live and Ghana Pay. You welcome back to Business on Newsnight. Now, oil exploration firm Talu has announced that it expects daily production on the field to exceed 100,000 barrels of crude oil this year. It is also planning to invest more than 70% of the group's capital expenditure in Ghana. Now, this was captured in the firm's January update and operational statement released today. There is more in this report. The target represents a marginal improvement from what it realized in 2022. According to Talo Oil, the growth will be driven by drillings on new wells on the Jubilee and Trinibua, in Tome and Yara area on Ghana's oil fields. Talo is also confident that these other measures that it has instituted will aid in the recovery of its operations going forward. The oil exploration firm also disclosed that Two wells that it drilled last year, as well as another in 2023, should be operational by second quarter. The update also showed that Talo is planning to invest $300 million this year in Ghana when it comes to capital expenditure out of $400 million that it is budgeting for the group in 2023. Majority of the funds, Talo Oil says, will be directed towards infrastructure. The oil exploration firm was however worried about $300 million put forward by the Ghana Revenue Authority, which it is disputing. And that is a business desk report. Now, meanwhile, Talo is contesting the over $300 million tax assessment by the Ghana Revenue Authority for this year, as well as a separate one that was done for last year. According to Talo, it is still engaging the Ghana Revenue Authority and government to reduce or review there's a separate tax assessment that was done in 2022 as well as the one done for this year now this is the second multinational to actually contest these tax assessments done by the Ghana Revenue Authority the first one was by empty and that is also contesting the over 8 billion tax charge by the tax authorities now, industries and businesses are warning of more layers if the Bank of Ghana goes ahead to increase its policy rate. They maintain that it will go a long way to increase the cost of credit at the time that most businesses 
are struggling to stay in business. The policy rate which increase actually influences the cost of credit in the country is currently pegged at 27 percent and there is the likelihood that it could go up next Monday when the Monetary Policy Committee concludes its meeting. Malpedua Boaje, a chief executive of the Ghana National Chamber of Commerce and Industry. We have heard a lot of them uh, uh, folding up, a lot of them and laying off people. The problem we have now not necessarily be resolved by just going to IMF. The problem is to ensure that we support and boost the production of the private sector in Ghana. And a high interest rate will not support that agenda. So we are pleading with the central bank, the governor, that they should look at the potential impact of an increment in policy rate on business. In fact, the rate we have now, the 20, 27%, is about the second highest we have had in our, in our economy. The highest is 275 mm. So we are just short by just 0 0.5. Any increment means that we are going to have the highest policy rate in our economy. And our policy rate and the lending rate, let me see, responds positively to increase in policy rate. Anytime the policy rate goes up, the banks are also businesses and they will respond appropriately by increasing the lending rate. Emak Bedwa Baji is the chief executive of the Ghana National Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Let's still stay on some concerns from the business sector because the recent tariff increment gazetted is there no turning back. Now, that's the position of the Public Utilities Regulatory Commission, PRC, in spite of warnings that it could potentially collapse the manufacturing industry. The PRC increased the average end user tariff for electricity and water by 29.96% and 8.3%. However, Chief Executive of the Association of Ghana Industries, Sechuma Kabwa, says the industry category rather saw over 48% increment despite the announcement of 8% upward across the board by the Public Utility Regulatory Commission and are therefore demanding a drastic reduction. This video, we had increments in the industry category by about 48%. Even though across board it was 8%, when you go into it, uh, it's not the same for all. So the industry category was 48%. From February, it means that the increment that has been located is what is starting from February. But uh, this is what we're saying. So it is it is the, the change that will take effect from February. But once it is passed, it's gazetted, it's going. It means that come February, that is the tariff that is going to be applicable. The Ghana National Chamber of Commerce and Industry has also decided to petition Parliament's Select Committee on Mines and Energy over the increase in the tariffs by the Public Utilities Regulatory Commission. Speaking to join us after an engagement with the Public Utilities Regulatory Commission says that I hit a snag. President of the Ghana National Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Clement Osea Marcus, said they will continue to push for a downward review for the increment. Laws are made by men. If it's gazetted, this is not the first time that um, prices have gone up, that it, it has not come down. We always make um, our voice known to them, and sometimes they look at the window and they adhere to that. Since government is the main stakeholder with its uh, utility companies, there's a way out of that we can forge ahead and get it done. They will have to look at it. If it has to go back to parliament for them to look at it, we'll do that. We'll lobby with the parliamentary select committee and all those that matters to make sure that we will not keep to the price. But in a sharp response, the chief executive of the Public Treaties Regulatory Commission, Dr. Ishmalaka, said nothing can be done about it since the tariffs has already been gazetted. This adjustment, the decision has been made and it has been gazetted. Uh, it's a law. So for now, nothing can be done on the part of PURC. However, there will be other quarterly adjustments. So we, what we are doing is to establish the protocols for engagement. We see that uh, we take, and let me also add that even before we engage the chamber, uh, PURC on its own had put in measures to protect industry. One of them was that we have been able to reverse the structure for the first time for SMEs. You had the chief executive of the Public Utilities Regulatory Commission, Dr. Ishmael Aka. Now, government has indicated that it is hoping. Let's move on to other stories. And government has indicated that it is hoping to finalize negotiations with all the stakeholders. 
when it comes to the domestic debt exchange program. Now, Joy Business is learning that the government has made some significant progress on reaching some agreement with insurance companies as well as the capital market players. Now, however, it looks like the biggest challenge now is to get on board the individual bondholders. In a later development, the Minister of Finance had earlier told Joy Business that they are working hard to ensure that they don't extend negotiations again after January 31. We have had a lot of them uh, uh, folding up, a lot of them and laying off people. The problem we have now is not necessarily be resolved by just going to IM. The problem is to ensure that we support and boost the production of the private sector in Ghana. And a high interest rate will not support that agenda. So we are pleading with the central bank, with the governor, that they should look at the potential impact of an increment in policy rate on business. In fact, the rate we have now, the 20, 27%, is about the second highest we have had in our in our economy. The highest is 27.5. Mm. So we are just short by just 0.5. Any increment means that we don't no, I don't think so. I, I'm confident that we'll get there. You know, we, we have done the um, staff level agreement, as you know. We met with the Paris Club membership, um, and we have given them till end of February um, for us to go through what we call the common framework. And then we expect them to go to um, board um, in Washington in March. Um, so really, we don't have that type of time. And that was the Finance Minister, Ken Oferata, speaking to us in an earlier interview. And apologies for that earlier mix-up with the sound. Two other stories. And let's, the Finance Minister, Ken Oferata, may need over $10 billion to plug the revenue gap as well as turn around the economy quickly. Now, that's according to the Member of Parliament for Tamale South, that is Harun Idrisu. The development that is the, minister, that, that is the Member of Parliament indicates that the IMF funds might not be enough to aid the recovery. Said Risu argues the development calls for more dialogue between the Finance Ministry and Parliament. The whole of Ghana is 10.5 billion US dollars. The IMF may provide some 3 billion, 1 billion from the bilateral or multilateral partners. 6.5 billion, or at least 4.6 billion, is expected from commercial creditors. Let that happen first before you talk about an IMF approval. IMF board meeting in March, I'm not even aware that they have a meeting in March. No, I mean, they, they ex they're expecting no, and I that they will get the executive alone, board approval. No, let alone expecting that the executive board of IMF will meet in March. I'm not aware. Uh, so you don't share in that optimism no, that they'll, they'll strike it and my, the executive board approval? My by optimism March. for Ghana for an IMF executive board approval contingent on the success of the domestic bond direction program. Debt exchange program and external creditors will be July, not March. And that is the member of parliament for Tamale South, Harun Edusi. He also alleges that the country's international reserves have declined to one month, development that he describes as serious. To other stories, uh, Windmill, that is the newest and the most dynamic e commerce platform, has officially been launched in the country with the tagline. Abundance of choice. It is promising to bring to its customers the best selection of products from top brands around the world. The company said its goal is to provide Ghanaian customers exceptional shopping experience. Founded in 2001, the I Pay for All Wing Mill originates from the United Arab Emirates. The stock market, if you are a shareholder in Cal Bank, you lost the Peswa and it's now worth 56 Peswas. And that's all for business on Newsnight. Thank you very much, George. Let's do sports. Ms. Bell, what do we have? Well, MFA, the Minister of Youth and Sports has denied allegations of confusion in the Black Galaxies camp due to non-payment of bonuses. Earlier, there were reports of agitations in camp due to the ministry's alleged failure to pay the team's bonuses and decision to reduce same. A situation which could impede preparation for the quarterfinal clash with Niger. However, in a statement published on its social media pages, the ministry clarified that it has since honored the $6,000 bonus of the team and further denied allegations of renegotiating the qualification bonuses agreed upon. According to the ministry, all is well in the camp while the team continue its quest to win the first chance trophy 
after missing out in 2009 2014 when they made it to the finals and just an update on ghana's antoine semenyor he has been linked with a move to crystal palace and hopefully before the end of the general transfer window is likely to head there likewise kamad in suleiman has also been eyed with a move to southampton and PSV Eindhoven in the Dutch Eredivisie. We we'll wait to see what happens to these Ghanaian players, and hopefully they just might secure this deal for themselves. Thank you very much, Ms. Bao. And Evans, it's just about five days to the expiration of the debt exchange deadline, and we're hearing about the untold story of how Ghan thousands of Ghanaians have been left without the investments and facing even more peril due to government's failure to pay them their investments in the amalgamated mutual fund now set to be further wiped out by the domestic debt exchange. We're learning more about this tell us yes i don't know if you remember in the midst of that uh, financial sector cleanup that happened many of the savings and loans went under and the government said well those who were saving there no fault of theirs government was going to protect them and so they set up this amalgamated mutual fund uh, was set up by the gcb capital limited uh, with funding from the government of ghana as a special purpose vehicle to implement a bailout program uh, for those investors whose funds were locked up in the uh, de defunct, now defunct, uh, fund management companies. The fund is an open-ended collective investment scheme. It is structured in two tiers. So tier one is a liquid component of the fund, which allows for immediate withdrawals if you desire. And then tier two is a long-term component with withdrawal restrictions uh, that uh, you, you can withdraw over a period of time. However, we are learning that that fund is empty. Uh, mm. But, however, it's still subject to the domestic debt exchange. And the people who were locked in this haven't been paid, but their you know, fund is also going to be wiped out by the domestic debt exchange. Let's bring in Yao Owusu Brifo, who is an accountant, but also uh, one of the investors, investors affected uh, by this. Yao, so you haven't been paid at all uh, from this amalgamated mutual fund? Um, Iban, we were paid uh, in 2020 and then in 2021. Last year, November, we were supposed to have received the tier two portion of that money, and it didn't come. I made calls to the fund, and they said they had not received any money from the Minister of Finance to pay us. And that on their own, they didn't have any money. So I said the Minister of Finance gave them funds and ordered them to pay. So f since 2021, you haven't received anything? No. And Actually, they even varied the terms of the payment because... When they were making the initial payments in 2020, the money was supposed to be spread into two. The tier one was immediately available, like you indicated. The tier two was then going to be paid over three years. But then in 2021, they said they were then going to spread it over a five-year period, which was going to make it six years to wait for the entire money to be paid. But that was fine anyway. So they paid the first portion in 2021 with a promise to pay another 20% in 2022, and then the remaining... 60% in the next three years. But last year, they did not make any payment. And they even had a courtesy of informing creditors there that they, they had not made any money. We waited and nothing came. People made calls. They were only told that they don't have money. And that was it. Now you have the domestic debt exchange. This this is double jeopardy for you. Yeah. What's, what, what's, your, what's your fear now, now that this is going to happen? Because obviously, you've not been paid. From everything I'm learning, there's nothing in the fund. This is further going to wipe out that investment you made. Yeah, I, I, do, I do have some innate feeling that the AM fund may probably have invested the money in these bonds as well. That, that could be contrary to the Public Financial Management Act because it was government's own money that was approved by Parliament to be used to pay these creditors. It couldn't have been used to buy government bonds again. But it amazes me how the AM fund is dry just after a year, after the entire $28 billion was approved for government to pay these creditors. So, I mean, this is why we are currently protesting the inclusion of individuals in this debt, domestic debt exchange because there are a lot of people in my category who lost money in the first banking sector cleanup and are currently also going to lose money in the exchange. So, you are just telling us basically that we can't trust banks, we can't trust uh, mutual funds, and we can't trust anybody else. Uh, lawyer Martin Kwebu joins us now. Uh, Martin, so you're hearing this story, and um, this is unfortunately one of those stories we haven't focused on at all in in this conversation with that exchange but they are significantly affected people who were victims of the banking sector collapse the last time who are again going to be severely affected by what is currently happening mm -hmm. that's correct evans that's correct and uh, you know yeah it's part of our uh, individual bondholders forum 
Yeah, a very active member. So, Evans, this is the more reason why we have to fight with the last breath that we can master to be able to hold government up. That is to say, the Minister for Finance should totally exempt individual bondholders because individual bondholders have suffered enough from the banking sector cleanup to the cost of living crisis last year, which we are still suffering. Prices of goods have skyrocketed, right? And some, a lot of them have remained up there. And so we are all suffering. And so the constitution makes it clear that don't kill citizens in the name of development. Don't kill citizens in the name of development. Because if you don't have people, then you don't have a country. So we are hoping that once the technical committee is done, the finance minister will exempt individual bondholders with this part quickly so that the anxiety, the palpitation, the agonies, and all the other things we are suffering will come to an end. Evans, people can't sleep. I don't know how many times I have to repeat this. People can't sleep. It's really, really terrible. This uh, uh, proposed inclusion of individual bondholders is causing lots of people sleepless nights. People's future have been jeopardized because they don't know whether uh, they will soon be exempted so that they know that they can get their money. Because let's not forget, this year about $6.6 billion of the bonds will mature. Yes, that's the next month. Quite a number of them will mature next month. It's a very significant number. So people are sitting on 10 thousand. And so we just pray that when the technical committee is done, the finance minister will let the people go quickly. Yeah. And very quickly, uh, Martin, we have a couple of days before this working week ends. Um, have we made any progress with the technical committee meetings? And are we expecting an announcement soon before Tuesday when the whole thing expires? Exactly, Evans. Exactly. We are currently trying to wrap up the report. Hopefully we should finish tonight and sign off. Then tomorrow, hopefully the finance minister should see it. And so later in the week, I mean, either, uh, yeah, during the weekend, I'm sure, because it's a very critical matter. This is a matter of life and death. I'm sure even if it goes into the weekend, he would look at it and then come to a decision about it. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. Thank you, Yao, for your time. This is an angle of this, you, uh, that, that we'll pursue uh, as we get into the end of the week and towards that deadline next week, Tuesday. In the class. And that's how we wrap up tonight's edition of News Night. Um, Strong and Sassy with the Nimwai Nimado is up next. I'm excited about the topic. I see the surprise on your face.